and only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Frank with um, the V Brownback, and today I have another Frank here on the call, um, Frank Denneman. And um, he's going to share a bit about um, the VMware on Amazon that is going to come very, very soon. And welcome, Frank. Uh, thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me. The, um, the topic you're talking about is pretty hot, right? Hybrid cloud? Yeah. So uh, it's about our new or our upcoming service, VMware Cloud on AWS. And if you look at all the social media platforms, it's, uh, it's buzzing and it's uh, very well anticipated. So uh, yeah, everybody's talking about it, it seems. Perfect. So if, if there is any questions, um, feel free to reach out to the uh, mentioned Twitter handles or use the Twitter hashtag vbrownback. I'll be monitoring Twitter throughout the show. Um, as well, you can simply raise your hand or post questions um, into the chat and we'll get to them. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Frank. Cool, thanks. So let me get my slide deck in a proper format. So um, I'm going to talk about VMware Cloud and AWS, as already uh, uh, described. And um, one of the uh, one of the statements that's uh, made quite often. Uh, by analysts and by, by, by CTOs is that speed is the new currency. And if you, uh, if you wonder what it is, it's actually uh, uh, a saying that, that, that states that you need to innovate to stay ahead of the competition. And companies who innovate faster have, and have a faster time to market are typically the ones that prevail nowadays. And the challenge of most IT organizations uh, and often the financial and the procurement organizations is that, uh, uh, that it needs to move at the same speed as the business. And that typically means expanding capacity and improving and ordering new hardware, but it typically takes months. So uh, this is primarily or the, the predominant reason why, why companies are moving to a cloud-first strategy. But uh, such a cloud-first strategy introduces new management problems to IT organizations because how are you going to manage all of these services and how are you going to bring them together? One thing you see is that an IT organization is moving to a more uh, manager of, of, of services than to actually build new infrastructure. So um, let's take a, a, let's take a step back and take a look at how we actually came to this situation and it looks like we're in the third fundamental structure transition in the history of IT we uh, uh, we most IT organizations started with a mainframe and in the mid 90s we moved from mainframes to a discrete platform on x86 hardware and I always get so that sometimes it, it looked like a bad opera episode because you get a server and you get a server and you get a server. Everybody gets a, an x86 server. Uh, I've been working with companies that had over more than over a thousand x86, uh, x86 servers just standing on tables, just plugged into the network and doing stuff they they they, they thought was uh, was good enough to to, uh, to actually to handle the service, right? But this server sprawl, it was actually the, the, led to the birthright of x86 virtualization, which is why most of us are here now. And, and virtualization uh, and the portability of workloads are actually the catalyst to cloud services. But what is cloud exactly and how do we consume cloud? Or when you say cloud, that's, that's basically a pretty broad statement because we have 
uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, uh, software as a service, right? So how do we uh, consume cloud? And when we, as we want to talk to our customers about cloud, which cloud operation model is uh, most popular? Yeah, um, then, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to stop you there. Um, it looks like you're presenting presenter view there. Um, I'm still seeing the very first slide. Can can you try to reshare? Really? Yeah. Ah, now it moved. Yeah. Okay. So what? So which slide do you see now? Introductory. So VMware Cloud on AWS. A closer look. V Brown back. What do you see now? Same thing. <laughs> it, it's it's wow. it's sharing the ah now I see speed as the new currency. Well, this is weird because I see my normal PowerPoint now. Hmm. Let me let me close the. Huh? The tech wonders of a Mac. Ah, uh, it's, it's <laughs> so that's why I'm a Windows that? fanboy. <laughs> well, every time I'm I'm thinking, should I uh, should I uh, should I buy a Windows machine uh, again or not? Let me see. What can I? How can I share my screen again? Uh, it should actually directly uh, say uh, show screen. Yeah, that's the full screen now. Okay, let's do this. Let's see. That looks good. That's full screen now. Yeah. Yep. Slides yeah. are advancing. Perfect. Okay. So <laughs> let's continue. So we talked about cloud. We talked about um, we talked about what type of model of cloud. Uh, 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 there are, and so what? What do our customers actually use? And um, it appears that hybrid cloud, by far, is the most popular model. Right, using on-prem data centers with a cloud service, and it doesn't have to be a data center model uh, because we transition from virtualization first to cloud first. But it just introduces a new way of thinking on how to deliver, deliver the services. And some customers are actually looking to get out of the business of owning and managing a data center. They want to go to a public mode, but um, they don't know how. Right? And uh, going to a full public mode, that's typically referred to as the data center zero model, in which the CAPEX model is transitioned to an OPEX model only. We only rent services, right? So no money is spent on computing hardware and, and the bricks and mortar of, of the data center. It's just renting services, right? And especially it, it helps because 83% of the workload are virtualized. And one of the often critiques heard of, of this, this model, of this data center zero model, is that it only is possible uh, when you don't have to deal with legacy application. So a, a, a very famous example is, of course, Netflix. Netflix is in, the, is in the, uh, the process of doing a data center zero model only. And people say, yeah, that's obvious because they build everything with microservices and it's all new, new, uh, new uh, cloud native uh, applications. But in reality, that's actually, uh, that doesn't have to be a limited thing. You can still run your traditional workloads in a uh, data center zero model. Uh, let's 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 uh, let's take a look uh, at that. So when you talk to customers that that have a hybrid cloud strategy or that have a cloud strategy, you ask, so what is the main reason to actually go to a cloud? And the, the primary reason is agility and speed. And agility is the most reason because it looks like uh, there is a barrier to attaining the agility, and the most common answer of, them, of the question, what is that barrier, is legacy infrastructure from a technology standpoint and from an operational standpoint. Because building and maintaining infrastructure can be extremely complex, 
it's time consuming and it's frustrating uh, to manage the infrastructure. And especially when you build, uh, when you start to rip and replace every three to five years, that's a risky endeavor. And if you talk to a lot of CTOs, the primary element they want to get rid of is risk, right? Yeah. So now, something a lot of people also underestimate is day two operations, right? If, if you're talking about agility and speed, uh, if yeah. you've just been involved in a project, we're basically upgrading hundreds of hosts over a six-month period now. It's just the amount of time spent on reboot waiting is um, is not what I would call agility exactly. <laughs> no, no, exactly, right? And especially, uh, it's always fun to hear when, when a lot of people talk about how we were going to move to cloud and we, I'm going to, uh, to help my customers to go to cloud and we're going to refactor and rebuild every application. Well, um, think back when we didn't have storage emotion, for example, right? And we needed to uh, we needed to uh, to incorporate a new storage array into the infrastructure. Think think back at this the the, the insane large Excel spreadsheets to figure out which workload we could migrate, we could shut down, we could migrate to a new storage array, right? Until storage emotion came along and basically it was the drag and drop uh, uh, operation. The thing is, it's all similar, right? We need to, when you start to refactor a, uh, an application, you need to contact your application owner, you need to start to, to work with them. What are your requirements? Or what is your expectation of the next couple of years? How do we scale this? Uh, are you going to move to another, uh, to another uh, platform? Totally, all those things are very, very uh, time, uh, uh, well, costly, right? And uh, level, uh, from it, not only from, from a time perspective, it's really complex, especially when you have uh, when you have uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of applications, right? But the interesting thing is, you brought up a good point about the procedures, and is that our landscape will shift and transform, right? Because a lot of monitoring tools and procedures are aimed at yesterday's data center. And when I talk about yesterday's data center, I'm talking about a a, a, a view that we only operate our own data center. But in reality, we already are in a, in a, in a phase or in a state, stage where we have a part public cloud and some workload running in our own data center. Right? And this is interesting because in, in essence, most IT organizations already deal with this hybrid environment. Now, during the keynote in Vegas, Pat mentioned that there are over 160 million workloads running in today's data center. And Gartner pro projects something around 30% of this workload will run in the public cloud in, in the 2020 timeframe. That's three years down the line, right? And I don't think we're going to hit this number, yeah, to be honest, uh, as an industry. But what it really means is that we're in the transition, right? We're going, uh, we're going to see workloads move or migrate or basically uh, uh, erect in a uh, in an in cloud environment or on an on prem um, together, right? So, how are we going to manage this all? And that's that's the interesting uh, interesting part I think for for most IT professionals to 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 think about in uh, in the next couple of years. Now, interesting thing is that. Uh, we are trying to, to uh, remove silos, right? Well, uh, we did this for, for a couple of years now that uh, the advent of virtualization showed that, hey, um, now your workload hits network, it hits storage, it hits compute, but these are all managed by different teams. Now, a lot of organizations have experienced that as a problem. Some organizations dealt with this problem by moving to a horizontal team, where a team now uh, consists of storage, uh, uh, man, uh, uh, storage admins and network admins and compute admins, while other organizations, they went the software route and said, I want to empower one of these admins and let them do all other things. And VMware catered with us, uh, for example, with VSAT, right? Now the administrator can, can manage um, 
can manage storage or vehicles. The same thing with NSX. Now the, the virtualization administrator can now work with the uh, can now start to, to provide network services, right? And this is interesting from from that perspective. If you go to a cloud model, to a hybrid cloud model, you're going to see that clouds will become the new silo because with all these cloud platforms, they have uh, they have different types of operation modes. So building and operating actually is the bottleneck of the of, of, of obtaining a hybrid cloud model. Because the most common challenges with public cloud adoptions are typically uh, these five challenges. You have operational consistency, right? It doesn't work the same on a, a vSphere platform as on a Azure platform, right? Migrating workload is not as easy as some people say it is because you have to deal with multiple VM formats. It's not a matter of, of converting the indication to, for example, an AWS AMI file. It's all about the operational consistency and, and trying to leverage your skill set and your tool set, right? Provisioning is different in a cloud than on-prem. And tool, tool sets are, are inconsistent. For example, you might have a, a, a monitoring tool. Can it monitor your workload that you run in one of those clouds, right? And think about your enterprise class uh, SLA, right? Uh, most of the traditional workloads that run in an enterprise data center are uh, stateful applications. If you look at the requirements of most cloud providers, they say, oh, look, the infrastructure uh, cannot be seen as uh, resilient enough for you uh, to drop a, uh, an enterprise uh, application. So you have to build availability in your app. Now, this is complete, the complete opposite of what we tried to obtain years ago with HA. Remember when we when we introduced HA and when we said, look, uh, you try to, to build in uh, high availability in your applications, such as uh, a Microsoft SQL Server or a Microsoft Exchange Server, and this is hard. This is really difficult to do, right? So why now? Why not move that 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 service to the infrastructure layer? And by a few clicks, every application is now uh, high available, right? And and we all. Uh, we all uh, were really excited about it, and it's, it's, it's still, and we still are, because HA is still the most used vSphere feature there is, right? So think about that when you want to transition your, your stateful applications to a cloud model. That is really difficult to do. Now, this is difficult for one uh, uh, cloud, an on-prem or, or an in-cloud, but what if you have multiple cloud? Uh, uh, providers, you will do. You will face the same challenges over and over again. So we thought long and hard about this, and and what we thought was let's let's partner up with the best uh, data center operator in the world, which is Amazon. Right? They know how to manage and operate at scale, and they have a global reach. Right? So. Couple that with VMware and you can start to build scalable cloud solutions actually anywhere in the world, but with your own skill set and your own tool set. So from, from VMware, you get the benefits that you can run your same teams with their current skill set and with their own tool set and their operation procedures. You can still fine tune your, your application because it just runs on, on vSphere and you are the one that controls it, right? Now, the benefits of AWS is, is obvious, right? So you have consumption economics. You go from a CAPEX model to an OPEX model. You don't buy services anymore, you just rent them, right? And they have unique services, right? And if you start to, uh, to, to connect those two together, you can create new and exciting uh, application or services for you. And of course, you have the scale and reach, right? So let's zoom into this a little bit more. What does it actually, uh, how does it actually look, right? 
Now, we start off by building a, a SDDC in the cloud. So we build a, a software-defined data center on AWS infrastructure. We use bare metal servers that is provided by AWS, and they, uh, they created this bare metal cloud service, uh, and we are their, their first consumer. And we, we install vSphere on dedicated hardware. And it's crucial to understand that it's your hardware, with that meaning that nobody else runs their workload on these servers. This is a public cloud. This, excuse me, this is a private cloud in a public, uh, at a public cloud provider, right? It's interesting to, to, to wrap your head around this. Um, but that's the that's the that's the that's the essence of this uh, of this 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 structure. Now we support VMs and containers. From for storage, we use vSAN, and we start off by using an all flash vSAN, an all flash array on vSAN. At a later stage, we're going to use Elastic Block Storage, but this is uh, this is scheduled for a later release. For uh, for network, we use NSX. And you can uh, you can start to at one point you can you can start to span your your security policies across multiple uh, clouds as well. vCenter is the management structure, so there's not going to be a vCloud director or anything else. It's just going to be your trusty vCenter, right? And that all runs on your your AWS uh, global infrastructure. Now the interesting thing is, of course, that we use vCenter as a management. Uh, endpoint. So think about that from a uh, from a hybrid cloud perspective. So you can run um, the SDDC in AWS as a bubble, meaning that you're not going to use a uh, a data center and on-prem data anymore. But what you also can do is you can use your own data center and connect these two. So you can connect both these centers. Uh, with a link mode version, and we're developing a speci uh, specified or a custom built uh, link mode for this service. And from that point on, you have a dashboard that shows your data centers. One you're on prem, the other one in cloud. Now, because we use vCenter, you can start to think about okay, I can use my other management tools as well, such as the vRealize suite. Right, you use vCenter endpoints, so you can you can um, you can push all your 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 normal operations to that environment. So essentially, what what's then the requirement on on the on-prem data center? Do I only the the only hard requirement for me is to still have a vCenter there, right? But from a yes. storage networking perspective. Um, that can be totally different, right? I, I don't really require vSAN on this um, to to actually host my virtual machines on-prem. No, correct. So we have a couple of requirements. Uh, one requirement is that we want to have a six a vSphere a six environment. We prefer six point five. Uh, the, the 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 lowest requirement is six of, excuse me six zero. Now the other thing is what we require is you run your vCenter on-prem. So your on-prem vCenter manages the, the ESX servers that are running in, inside your own data center. The vCenter that is running uh, in the cloud manages those ESX servers, right? What we do recommend is you recommend to use NSX. It's not required. But it's recommended. It will help you create a better experience, a more uh, transparent experience when you start to build your, your hybrid cloud. vSAN, exactly the same, right? Uh, from an operational procedure perspective, uh, it's easier to have those uh, two uh, environments you know, um, uh, basically be managed by, uh, uh, in the same way. Right, because we, uh, vSAN, of course, have, have uh, those uh, SPBM storage, uh, storage uh, policy-based management, and now it's oh, it's it's interesting. Just basically uh, uh, manage the things in an equal way. If you have a, uh, a centralized storage, 
it's difficult to mimic the same thing. It, it works, that's not a problem, but at one point you start to, to try to simplify operational procedures, right? And having things similar typically helps. Oh, Make yeah. sense? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Okay. So how, how would I then get my workloads back and forth? Um, is it just a long distance vMotion basically then between the two vCenters yeah. or? Yeah, at one point you will, uh, you will get the ability to vMotion between uh, in-cloud or on-prem and in-cloud and vice versa, right? Uh, it's just a virtual machine, so you can start to migrate um, your workload from your on-prem to your in-cloud, and if you want to move it back, you can move it back. And now this is the cool part, right? Look at all the features that we're using. We're using stuff like long distance vMotion, we, we, we do stuff like a vMotion without shared storage, and you go between distributed switches. Those are all, all things, are all features that we developed years ago. So these things are, are, are mature technologies that we now are able to implement in one uh, consistent manner. It, it almost feels like we've been been, been thinking about this for a long, long time, and now it just comes together, right? Because we can now use all these cool features, features like VXLAN, features like enhanced link mode, features like global catalog, uh, the content library, for example, right? All, yeah. that, all, uh, all, all those things now make absolute sense. Yeah, it's, it's also an analogy Joe Bagley likes to use, right? The STDC basically being the operating system for the cloud making it is. The, the cloud your new data center and um, the underlying stack basically just becomes now the part you operate as a whole, software defined rather than a uh, minutious detail on every single server. It becomes more of a kettle than, than a pet now. Exactly, and the thing is you've been doing this for a while now, right? So for myself, I've been, in, uh, I've been working with virtualization since uh, 2005, so it's now my 12th year. So I've been used to this for a while, so I know exactly how to do things. And there's a lot of other people who've, who had the same track record, right? It's, it's difficult to, to learn uh, uh, new environments, right? And especially with the amount of pressure that everybody has nowadays, we need to do a lot of things at once. The last thing you want to do is, is learn it again. And with this, it's just doing the same thing, to, to have a... a to have a good, uh, a good example, um, if we want to do a, a demo or a hands-on lab, it's not going to be the most sexiest uh, hands-on lab there is, because once you connected it, it's just vCenter, and you just see the ESX host. There's nothing special about that, and you can be motion. Hey, we've all been demotioning since, uh, since a while now, right? It's just the same thing, but it's running on AWS infrastructure, and because of that, we can do a lot of other cool things. For example, at one point, we can connect natively to AWS services, right? So now you can start to think of, how do I incorporate this with an EC2 uh, uh, service? Or what you can do, one of the cool things is, let's say you have an application that is already consuming uh, Amazon services as of now, but you're running those uh, those workloads in your uh, on-prem data center by moving them closer to your uh, to your data source for basically the whole data gravity uh, idea. You're avoiding a lot of cost because data is not egressing from from uh, from uh, the cloud provider, uh, and it's performing in a different way. And just by demotioning your workload to uh, to your uh, Amazon infrastructure that, that I believe that's that's just brilliant, right? Again, you just move it. No refactoring, uh, no change in, in the way you operate things, you just migrate it. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah. So I, I basically don't have to learn AWS now, but Essentially, I, if, if I have that knowledge in-house, I, I can leverage those APIs. Um, but someone like me, and Jesus, I've dealt with virtualization for 
just five years now, so I'm still a junior. But um, I'm, I'm used to that system, right? Um, and I hate learning new stuff. <laughs> it's tedious. Uh, so e essentially, I, I like boring, right? Bo boring means I, I don't have to invest a lot of time in, in this um, to, to actually um, still utilize everything. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, learning is still a good thing. Uh, I, I I agree with you on, on on most of these points. But the thing is, with this, you can now start to do it at a more acceptable pace because instead of uh, not only learning about how the infrastructure works and 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 what things you uh, you need to 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 create and interact, you can now only start to pinpoint particular services, right? Let's say you have an application that wants to consume an S3 bucket. Now you only need to understand, okay, how do I connect that to an S3 bucket? What are my APIs you need to consider? How can I get that data there? Instead of, I need to create a virtual machine, I need to figure out how it works, I need to make it resilient, I need to uh, uh, make sure I can connect it. All those things, that's not necessary anymore. And I think that that helps to grow better to a new uh, new way of service, right? Now, one of the other brilliant things is scale, right? So, if uh, if you have the ability to create such a data center anywhere around the world, that's just I believe brilliant. So, when you obtain new businesses and or you're going to create a new business in a new country, one of the things is you need to start to, to build IT services. So that means, am I going to build my own data center or do I do a co-location or do I talk to a cloud provider and what type of hardware do I need and all that stuff. But with this solution, you just log on to a portal, you select the location you want to uh, you want to, to use for your data center, you select the number of hosts, you click, click on OK, you connect it, and you have a full SDDC stack up and running within no time with the quality you are already familiar with. And I think that's uh, the brilliant thing of starting a, uh, of, of helping you expand globally. Now, one thing, one thing we need to, to make very clear is that VMC is sold as a service. It's not a product, it's a service. And that means that VMware is going to manage the hypervisor and the management components. AWS will manage the physical resources, but when something is wrong, you will call VMware. We will take it from there. We will help you out there. Uh, uh, there's only one service partner for you as a customer, and that is VMware. Now, you are the one as a customer that manages the VMs. So you decide how many VMs you run on an ESX host and, and, and what to do else. Now, there are some restrictions, of course, because uh, we still need to manage the, the, the software and we need to manage the hardware. So one of the things that is restricted is, for example, uh, root access. We don't provide root access to customers. We are the one that uh, we are the ones that, that manage the, the ESXi house. That also means that you cannot install a, a, a VIP, right? So some services, some software, uh, are not able to to be uh, are not available in a VMC environment, in a VMware Cloud and AWS environment. So this is interesting for you to understand when you are transitioning to that model. That you need to figure out: Can I use my my my, my services? or talk to your, your third-party vendor and say, okay, how are you getting VMC ready, right? Now, there are other things such as networking and, 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 uh, and other management stuff. I'm in the, uh, in the process of actually writing a, uh, a paper on the restrictive access model, so expect that in a, in a, in a, in a couple of uh, weeks to actually uh, see that published. So essentially the the tedious patching part goes away, right? Because um, that's all done on, on the underlying infrastructure. How how would that work now if, um, let's let's say, we get a new performance boosting update um, for for my on-prem vSAN? I, I, I want to upgrade my on-prem, um, this uh, basically 
VMware then um, keep track of that and um, upgrade the cloud parts um, accordingly, or is that completely independent essentially then? So uh, a good, uh, that's a, thank you for that question. So what happens is that typically we will uh, uh, we will run the latest version in VMC. So before you actually uh, get the, 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 the patch as a customer, we have already applied that to the VMC environment. That's the expectation. One other thing uh, that you need to do is you actually, when you run an hybrid cloud, you need to connect your vCenter to the vCenter in cloud, and you're going to log in to that vCenter to actually get a, a view of both environments. We do that because we will allow uh, that vCenter to have a broader reach or to a broader support for versions. Typically, uh, a vCenter only has the portability of one past feature of one for uh, or one uh, sorry one version that is uh, uh, behind. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, loosen that that restriction, so the customer doesn't need to move as fast as we do, right? Because typically with enterprises, it uh, they don't patch as often and as frequently as. Um, uh, as, as a, a cloud service, right? So we need to go the other way and basically say, you can run now uh, a couple of versions uh, lower or, or older than, than we are, right? We don't patch your environment uh, on-prem, of course. We only manage our own environment uh, in cloud. Make sense? Yep, it does. So one of the, the questions I always get, so okay, so what is why uh, uh, what are the, the, the typical use cases? So what are the typical scenarios to, 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 to do this? And there are the three main scenarios that, that can be identified. And with our future cross cloud technologies, um, you can have a lot of experience and freedom. So at one end of the spectrum, you might choose to maintain your, your on-prem environment and expand it uh, to public cloud for particular workloads or particular applications, so maybe like the, the best for disaster recovery or even seasonal spikes, right? Another thing is I need to get out of my data center business. I don't want to, to uh, uh, I don't want to, to manage brick and mortar anymore. Uh, I want to consolidate my my, my on-premise workload and move it to the to the to the to the, uh, to the public cloud. Uh, what you want, to, what you're also going to do is you kind of start to flex uh, as as you go along. So you start to to build uh, a on a in cloud environment, and then slowly start to reduce or eliminate your on premise infrastructure and move it to the private cloud. So have a select have a select workload running on prem and have a a, a large environment uh, in cloud. Typically, where you see that with production uh, environments. They want to have particular applications close to the production uh, or manufacturing elements. But for uh, office applications and, 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 and the back office and all the supporting applications, so you can run that on a, VM, uh, on a VMware environment in cloud uh, perfectly as, as normal, of course. So this allows you to, to choose between your, the CAPEX model and the OPEX model, of course. Uh, yes, still using VMware as your, your, your data center operating system. Now, because of that, you can start to think about capacity planning, right? And I call it capacity planning challenges, but it's more or less capacity planning uh, opportunities, right? Because resource management of current workloads and future workloads are is, is really difficult. Right? And it's not only difficult from my perspective that, hey, what am I running right now? But what, are, uh, what will I run in the near future? But also think about maintenance and uh, high availability. What happens on a short term and what happens on a long term uh, event when an HA or when a host dies, right? Now, you, start, you need to think this as something as similar as ordering an Uber. 
right? You, you just need the service, right? So that means that when you open up your app and you select a, and you basically say, I want to go there, Uber will send you a car. But what happens if that, that, that car fails in the process of, of, of reaching you? Basically, it travels to you and it fails. Now, you don't need to, need to reorder your, 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 your Uber. Uber sends you a new car. Right? It sends you a replacement. And to be honest, as a consumer of Uber, you don't care which car will pick you up as long as the car is there on time and uh, on the agreed pickup location. Right? It, it just needs to have capacity to bring you from point A to point B. Now, with the fleet management of AWS, actually, we are able to deploy a new host similar as Uber. Right? With vSphere, we can actually attach a new host to the cluster ready to go in just mere moments. When a host fails, the HA, and this is a new service, auto remediation, actually replaces that host. So a host dies or a host fails, HA will pick it up and actually issues an API call to the AWS fleet management and a new physical host will be attached to your cluster. vSAN will be, will be integrated with that as well. So you are getting the resources you're paying for without any human interaction. I think that is the key of things, right? Now, and because what we can do with HA, it also provides us opportunities to expand the RS, right? Because if you can uh, use just an API call to add a new host, a new physical host when an HA event occurs, same thing you can do with resource management. The moment you see that DRS or the cluster itself is, is, is growing beyond the capacity or beyond the resource capacity of, of the cluster, you can actually start to, to issue an API call and saying, hey, give me a new host, give me additional uh, resources. Now you, can, you cannot do that in your own data center, maybe a small number of customers of VMware can do that, but typically the majority of customers don't have a couple of hosts uh, in their apps as a spare waiting for, for a resource burst to actually happen. Now with AWS, you just have it on call. And I think this is one of the most exciting features uh, of, um, of EMC. Now you can have that done automatically, but you can also have it manually. So when you need to have additional resources, you just right click on your cluster and say resize. And now pay attention, we say resize because we can grow the cluster, but we can also shrink the cluster. So the minimum number of hosts is four. That's where you start with, that's the initial cluster size. But the moment you start to grow, and you start to grow to, to six or eight or whatever, you basically increment per one. Um, but maybe, for example, you have seasonal workloads and you have a spike. Let's say you are a IRS of a, uh, of a particular country. Now, there's always a period in time when everybody is filing their tax returns. Now, for, and in that time, you need to have uh, additional capacity. So and you know you the day before, <laughs> the day before the deadline. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or after, and you just say, "Oh, I'm really, really sorry." <laughs> but in general, most most uh, most people will, will will file it in a particular month, right? Now, for that particular time, you need to have uh, additional capacity. For the rest of the uh, the rest of the year, you don't, right? Now, with that, you can basically resize your cluster to whatever you want to need, whatever you need. But at the moment, your spike is gone. You can say I want to reduce my, my host size and you just resize it back to a to a uh, number that, that, that allows you to run your workloads uh, adequately. I think that's that's really, really a, a, a strong feature because this allows you to start to rethink the way you do capacity management. Right? Yeah. I, you I think, have to, yeah. Yeah. Did, didn't we demo that last VMworld? Um Yes. With with Alexa, yeah. right? I, I I mean Alexa for me is, has always been the the toy thing, the the cool neat stuff. Um, that that just um, but the I, I'm not gonna sit at my desk and shout at Alexa to, um, to, to uh, expand my DRS cluster in the cloud. Um, I I think that's not a 
uh, operational model most companies will <laughs> um, will adopt. Um, but basically, it just shows uh, that there is some sort of API integration, right? And you you mentioned yeah. um, DRS integration there as well. So is yeah. is is there basically something similar than um, like to, today on prem we we have predictive DRS, right? Um, so D DRS will basically learn um, when when clusters get busy to essentially um, move VMs before any contention happens. Um, yeah. is, is this something similar then where um, the clusters can be taught to, to resize um, on, on patterns as well? Well, I think that fine, that will eventually show up. The predictive, uh, the predictive DOS we haven't, uh, it's not scheduled for, for GA. But one of the things that, 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 uh, that is in, uh, or that is in the near future available is uh, this feature um, and uh, the Elastic DRS feature uh, is uh, is uh, operated by a threshold. So you define a particular threshold, and uh, and once you go over that particular threshold, DRS will start to add new host. Now you can actually uh, configure uh, Elastic DRS to have a, a maximum of host that it can add. Right, so you don't. Uh, it's not like you basically log on to your your SDC environment in cloud, and uh, you see sixteen hosts running. Right, it's you can actually say I have four, and I want to burst to a maximum uh, of another four, so in total eight. Right, you can all you can do this, but you can also do this manually, of course. Yeah. Right, but as of now, it's threshold driven, and I hope to see predicted DRS. Uh, appear in VMC, but I will leave. I I I, I won't be surprised if that happens. Hmm. Right? It, so, it makes sense. And basically, with the thresholds, I I then get that um granularity on on the HA bit that you mentioned, right? Because if if I have the possibility to just add another host to that cluster within within mere moments, I can basically. Um, be less conservative in, in sizing, right? I just say, well, if my cluster is running at 95%, add a new host. Exactly, right? So, so you can start to think about, okay, uh, how do I, uh, how, what is my opinion about HA uh, failure uh, policies, right? So uh, do I actually need to have two hosts uh, available because I don't want to have a long-term resource management problem? Right, short term, most people can, most organizations can handle that. But from a long term perspective, that's going to be very nasty when you, uh, when your cluster size is reduced from, from available resources. Now with this, it's just being, added, it's just added automatically, right? So you can start to think about, do I want to uh, run my, my, my host a little harder? Do I want to increase my consolidation ratio? That's one of the, the things. Of course, there's always this, uh, how many eggs do I want to get in one basket? But that's that's uh, it. It it allows you to th to remove the long term constraints of HA uh, uh, events. Now, similar, this also applies on maintenance, right? So one of the things that you typically see in an, in a data center is that uh, when you patch, you put a host into maintenance mode, and that means vSAN is not not running on that that host, and 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 DRS cannot consume those those compute resources as well. So you you're doing uh, you're reducing your your effective resources in your cluster. Now with VMC, we will actually uh, place new host into your cluster the moment we patch your service. So if you if you buy a service or if you get a service for four host, that means you always have four hosts of, of available resources. Because the moment we start to press, it's not fair for you to get a uh, get a reduced number of resources, right? So those things are are also possible with this. And now one of the things is we need to look at the way we do our policy management on uh, on patching because some customers don't want to have but uh, don't want to have their their environment patched in a particular. Time, for example, when your fiscal quarter ends, or when you have seasonal 
uh, spikes. The last thing you want to do is is get is uh, to 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 be more more at risk when you pass, right? So we are looking into that and how to deal with that. But that's stuff that that we're working on right now and, and is decided once we uh, we start to release the product or release the service. And with, with this in mind, um, you have to start to think that host are ephemeral, right? And you already brought up that pets versus cattle um, discussion. Um, you can talk about pets versus cattle. Uh, I'd like to say there are no snowflakes anymore, right? Host come and host goes. That means that we're going to have a particular host name that typically is not aligned with your operational procedures. So think about this when you when you have like scripts or particular operations where you define a particular host name. That's something you need to, to, to change because a host can be replaced any moment. A host can be added any moment. A host can be uh, removed any moment. That will have an effect on your on your operational procedures. How do we connect things? And um, uh, I, I won't go into much detail about the network, uh, networking uh, uh, details, but the interesting thing is that you can have IP, uh, VPNs and at one point you will have the ability to use your AWS Direct Connect and use NSX to do a full uh, service uh, connectivity uh, at every level meaning that you can do uh, uh, NSX security policy stretching, VXLAN, all that stuff. Most customers will start with a VPN between your on-prem data center to your uh, in-cloud data center and maybe at one point we'll start to consume an AWS Direct Connect. An AWS Direct Connect is typically a, a, a physical wire going from what your endpoint in the data center to, uh, to a switch of AWS itself. So if you have an endpoint in an Equinox data center, for example, that's getting connected to AWS directly. Now, when you take a look at the, the, the uh, like a 10,000 uh, feet overview of the environment, you will see that there are some gateways. There's a management gateway that is available for VMware, and there is a uh, customer gateways that is available for the customers. So, if you look closely, you see that we're running this inside a SDDC cluster. So, the vCenter and your platform uh, 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 service controller and your NSX services are running inside your cluster. They will consume some of the resources, of course, just as normally as your on-prem environment. We will manage those virtual machines. You cannot manage those. You, you can see them, but um, they're basically restricted from uh, to, to be, be changed. Now, what uh, what we can do, what we can't do, is we cannot touch your VMs. There's no way we can 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 meddle with your VMs, right? This is all described in that, that restricted access model paper I was talking about uh, before, right? So, in your compute pool, you will have an NSX Edge gateway, right? There are some logical switches for your for your virtual VM and of course firewall and VPN for security. But the idea is that you cannot touch the management stuff, we cannot touch the, the, the workloads. Now, this service is not yet uh, delivered. It's not yet operational. We are working on this previously. Uh, we're now in the Lighthouse project, meaning that we have a select few customers who are running uh, in, on the infrastructure, testing things out, helping us uh, define and, and re, uh, redefine some of the, the, the features, right? At one point we will get into a beta program and once the beta is completed we will go to a uh, general availability. Now that, uh, what, uh, what do you need to do in the meantime? Because if you want to consume the service, as we already mentioned, you need to have vSphere 6.0 or what we recommend is 6.5, and um, you uh, need to, to, to have another uh, features set, or basically 
what you need to do or what you should do is you should look at particular services. One of the things that is interesting is the um, uh, the uh, content library. That's one of the, the interesting things. The moment you start to uh, use content library, you can start to sync between uh, data centers. So your in-cloud data center and your on-prem data center. Most of the customers now don't have that feature uh, enabled or are not using that feature. This is something interesting that you, you can take a look at in the meantime. Another thing, of course, the big thing is, of course, getting your, your platform up to 6.5, right? Uh, a lot of customers are still in the process of, of migrating to 6.0 or to 6.5. This is an, uh, a, a great opportunity to go to 6.5 to actually say to your organization, hey, if we want to move to that environment, we need to update our environment as well. One thing that, that a lot of customers are thinking about is uh, creating a separate cluster with the latest bits um, and to have that ready once the DMC service comes online. But you also have to think about your, your services and the way you uh, uh, the way you look at your own environment. So what we already discussed, think about consolidation ratios, right? Can I run a little bit harder? Think about the way you want to to uh, want to consume your resources in general. Which applications need to run where? Can I? Which applications are our primary or our excellent use cases to transition over to the to the in cloud environment? Those things are, are, are interesting to work on right now. So what we like to call is get VMC ready. Start to invest time in this right now. So the moment uh, VMC comes online, you're ready to go, right? One of the, the, the questions that I typically get is when is it available? And uh, the official statement is summer 2017. <laughs> so what summer? <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, especially from a infrastructure point of view, right? Um, if, if there's current scripts, etc., that's that's going to be interesting to rewrite them. Um, yeah. I think that's th that's essentially a, a good opportunity to to get involved in in the overall community as well. Um, if if you look at projects like VMware Code, um, or even um, just sharing your own scripts on um, on a GitHub. Um, to, to make them as generic as possible, um, to try to avoid very specifics in, in those scripts to, to become cloud ready, right? A lot today is about that automation piece um, so that you can actually play a bit of solitaire next, ne uh, next to your day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, that's the key, right? Uh, when, we talk a lot of, when we talk to a lot of customers, they are like, uh, when I talk to uh, to see those and they're like, I, I, I want to have this available right now. And uh, I, I totally agree with them and, and that is really cool to hear that, that this is uh, in, in high demand. But the thing is, are you actually ready as an organization to start to consume this? Um, and that's where uh, people need to think about, like, am I ready? Uh, do I have the right bits? Do I have been such ready? Can I make it as seamless as possible, the transition? Think about this now. Now you have the time, right? Now is the excellent time to to uh, to, to to invest uh, energy and and, and 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 sit with the team, start thinking this over, start start talking about this. That helps a lot, I believe. Yeah, and it's not it's not only the technology piece, right? Um, so summertime is coming up. <laughs> um, it, it's it's also a big big organizational shift. Um, every time I I'm I'm out there either helping um, someone or um, getting a ticket in here in in my normal day job. Um, you you can really feel those silos. So go have a chat with your network admins. <laughs> um, how how they like to do stuff, right? Um, breaking down that communication chain, um, or starting to break that down. Um, saves a lot of time. I mean, you, you can have the best automation in place, you can have the, the best um, cloud in place. If, if you still have an internal approver policy process of two months to get an IP address, um, it's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. 
And those are the things that, that, that uh, I believe that the, the BMC will uh, help us to actually convey this message for a lot of uh, IT uh, admins internally. And uh, so everybody wants to to to, uh, to become a customer of BMC, or at least that's what we hear. Uh, but now they can start to say, okay, if you want to actually, uh, if you if you think this as a possibility, we need to change as well. By then, before this, a lot of customers had this problem with convincing everybody that this was the way to go forward. Now it seems like a logical choice. Right? Now it's just logical to actually implement NSX. Before that as well, but now it becomes more convincing to most. Right, so there is this visible use case. That's what I want to uh, want to uh, to address, and and yeah. So I want to leave with with the statement that that VMC is an extension. Right, you have to to look at this as an extension of your own on-prem data center. So the, the the powerful and the mature product operation system that you're already using right now, vSphere, is just there as well, but it's just on a different infrastructure that allows you to scale properly without the headaches of procurement and without the headaches of, of, of time itself. And I think that's the strongest thing. So with your own tool set and with your own skill set, you can now become a true cloud consumer. Cool. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, if there is any follow-on questions, I'd say you're very much available on Twitter or via social media to answer them. Yes, so you can reach uh, you can uh, reach me at Frank Denneman on Twitter, and uh, for 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 other questions, we have a team uh, ready that that responds to at VMware Cloud, and if you tag your question with the hashtag VMware on AWS, uh, there's a lot of VMware people that that will uh, that will help you. Uh, get a better understanding of the, the upcoming service. Okay, perfect. Then cool. Thank you very much. And I, I, I think um, you, you were planning with Niels to, to be on another one of the rebrown backs soonish as well to, yes. to talk about um, the whole premise of the, um, of the new performance book, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, perfect. And, uh, we expect to have the book available in the uh, beginning of June, so oh. it's it's really soon. I'm I'm looking forward to that one, definitely. <laughs> right. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much okay. for your time today, and yeah, thanks everybody for for attending as well. And next week we'll have um, someone in the Americas actually hosting. Um, it's going to be a VCDX panelist Q and A. Um, get your questions cleared with um, Joel Sivagi and a couple of surprise guests. So we will happily welcome you again next week. Have a nice evening. Have a nice morning. Have a nice afternoon wherever you're sitting. Goodbye. <laughs>